Hello, everyone in person. Uh, welcome to the AS workshop of service computing. And then Alec invited Mike Barron from IBM to give us the keynote talk. Alec, could you go ahead to introduce Michael? Yes. So uh, welcome, everybody, to eight serverless uh, workshop. Uh, we hope that you will have good experience. Uh, you should be already uh, on our Discord server. Feel free to ask the questions in uh, Zoom chat. And, you know, if you are in person, just, you know, you can raise your hand. But if you are a remote participant, you can also write your question in Discord, especially after the talk is finished, both keynote and other talks. And uh, let's start with the, our keynote speaker. And Michael has a lot of experience with serverless computing working on well, uh, open source uh, Apache OpenWhisk and then working on many other IBM products, which I think he will mention. Michael, can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, very good. Okay, so thanks for, for having me. Um, it's it's a pleasure talking to you about like some of the, the perspectives that, that I've been gathering over the last several months and, and years now that the serverless topic uh, has been around for a while and I, I i would like to share them with you in this session and and get your feedback and maybe a discussion going about like um the implications of this so the idea is basically while serverless is being talked about a lot and many people are using it in the very macro level grand scheme of things if you look at like what's the IT footprint overall work worldwide, um, serverless is still the minor minority um, of workloads. There are, there are tons and tons of non-serverless workloads. And I would like to discuss the question of like, why is that the case? What do we need in order to reverse that ratio basically to um, have like 80% being serverless and 20% and only being the non-serverless part of it? So if we think back um, where the whole serverless movement is coming from, I still remember it was in October 2014 when uh, Tim Wagner presented um, uh, Lambda for the first time and there was a big buzz around it. And um, AWS Lambda basically coined the perspective of what, what FAST means, what function as a service means um, in the year 2014. And and the, the 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 years after that, and um, while when when talking to customers, they they love the value proposition that they get with um, that definition of of serverless. But as we'll see later on as well, th there are some issues with that as well, or some gaps that we need to address. But what are these common serverless attributes that people like, no matter? which which perspective they are taking on serverless. First off, they don't want to do capacity lifecycle patch or operational management anymore of their capacity, in particular by giving away the lifecycle management of capacity um, to the provider. It allows the provider to be super efficient in terms of when to provision and deprovision things, which is then reflected in a very granular um, billing mo model that makes things, um, in many cases, so much more attractive than running them in the traditional way. Also, they never have to pay for idle, be it um, capacity that's that's uh, more needed for work workload spikes and, and that is idle or um, really scaling to zero. But in, in, in general, there is a perfect alignment between like what the customer has to pay and what, what they um, are getting for that. And the third point is, of course, transparent scaling. Like, as I, as a customer, given I give away the lifecycle management of my capacity, um, it's now in the hands of the provider to do the scaling, and usually that goes very um, quick and instantaneous, as we'll as we'll see in a second. Um, so I, I still remember when doing some of the first engagement with IBM Cloud Functions and, and customers, one of them approached me after a while and said, they achieved 90% savings and they got a 10x performance increase because they can scale so quickly um, that they couldn't believe it initially. But, but these kinds of stories are not one-offs. They, they happen in many, many uh, situations as well. 
And that, that's what captures people's imagination about serverless. Now, us being in the year 2022, there is something that I, I would call serverless 2.0. There are many other perspectives on it, but it is basically about like applying these core principles that we know from FAST to a much broader, much, much more general purpose set of services and providing those value propositions. So um, another point that is maybe a bit provocative, but I, I think it, there is something to it, is like, in terms of the workload that we are addressing with these technologies, have we as an industry focused on the quote unquote right problem so far? If you look at like many of the case studies out there around what, what I call serverless 1.0 here, um, there are a lot about HTTP endpoints, be it with an API gateway for a REST API or for a web application, but it's it's serving HTTP in one or the other case. The other category is event handling, but if you look at, again, the, the overall IT footprint of a large enterprise, let's say they have a, an annual budget of a billion US dollars, the, the, the fraction of these kinds of workloads um, measured against that, that budget, is in many cases um, marginal. Um, so cu customers like large enterprises who want to benefit from serverless, they can only get the benefit for a very small slice of their overall IT budget. And therefore they, they cannot take full advantage of, of the benefits. Of course, what's important is to look at both the, the raw resource cost footprint um, and the productivity gains. Um, but like I said, in, in many cases, it, the, the, the set of workloads that we are talking about here, uh, then people decide to, uh, to run with 256 megabytes of memory or 512 megabytes of memory. But in the grand scheme of things, in the context of a large IT budget of an enterprise, th this is really marginal, marginal footprint in many cases. So um, another point that um, I think we should make, be conscious about is like, while the cloud is the new platform, if you look at like what has been built on top of clouds, in many cases, it's just a respin of what we had before. And in many cases, it's a collection of app servers, databases, and web servers. And it's, it's time for us, I think, to start treating the cloud more and more like like a, a super scalable computer that I run my code on at any scale. I, I can view it as an extension of my laptop or I can view it as like one gigantic machine that I can run things on without having to worry about. But that's the kind of mentality we need to apply there. So what are the key customer problems that we, that, that we are seeing today um, still existing and which, which one should we be solving first? Like I mentioned before, infrastructure and, and operational costs are still high because if, if we're honest to ourselves, there has not been real innovation in the, in the space of general purpose virtual machines and containers over the last decade. Like the way we are launching virtual machines, the, the way we are dealing with them, hasn't really fundamentally changed or has, hasn't fundamentally experienced like a step function change in terms of innovation that we're doing things totally different now than, than 10 years ago. In many cases, it's pretty much the same old stuff that we've been doing for the last 10 years. And um, what is also interesting to note is that infrastructure capacity is only very loosely coupled to the application needs. So. In many cases, we provision infrastructure, like we, we provision five VMs, and then as the next step, we install software on top of it, versus just treating the underlying infrastructure as, as an element of the software that we are running, um, which would give us a much better handle in terms of optimizing the lifecycle management of those resources, because with that, we can make sure utilization is always optimal. Um, what, has also not happened yet is um, 
to make it possible to let the applications that have been built over the last decades benefit from the serverless value propositions that today in the vast majority of cases only applies to new greenfield stuff. And um, new greenfield stuff is by its very nature much less than what has been built over the, the many years before that. Um, like I said, also customers still very often operate on the level of an individual VM, while distributed systems are on the other end becoming um, the de facto standard. And in terms of compute choice, like there is x86, but we're seeing like an, an emerging um, effort going on like, around like things like um, using mainframe resources, using quantum resources, also in, in the context of building an application. Now, um, if we look at what really has really changed between the 1.0 and the 2.0 perspective that I mentioned, the workload definition in 1.0 was quote unquote, just a function snippet. In 2.0, the way I see it is the most general purpose construct and we have is um, an executable, like a command line string. It can be a container, it can be a binary, it can be um, a command, it can be a script, but something that I execute on an operating system, if you look at like what we're doing in the IT industry in general is we are running processes on operating systems. Um, the barrier of entry is, is, is with 1.0 is relatively a big because in many cases often code has to be rewritten or changed. Um, while in the ideal case, we want to also be able to reuse ex existing executables without having to change them. Um, workload focus, we talked about going from HGP endpoints to more compute and data intensive workloads, which are more attractive from the financial point of view. Um, also compute is like very, very general purpose, not limited to a certain maximum amount of uh, CPUs and memory and so on. Execution time is basically unlimited. And also in terms of network protocols, we, we are much more flexible there versus today. It's in most of the cases you can do HTTP and events as the inbound protocols. There are tricks of, to work around them a little bit, but by and large, that, that's, that's what is there today. So uh, and another perspective that um, should not be taken too serious, but there is some truth to it, is like 99.x% of the internet is already serverless for many years. And why is the cloud lagging behind? Um, what I mean by that is when we access websites, when we access like this Zoom session, when we access anything on the web, we just hit a URL and we use what's what's there. And we never see a server somewhere. And um, like this web conference, nobody went into a portal and provisioned some servers and then put the web conference on top that, that all came as part of it. <clears throat> but in the, in, in um, I, IT, like if you look, uh, think about virtual machines, you still provision a virtual machine or you still provision a container. And then almost as a secondary step, you put the application on top. Yes, you can bake it into the image, but still these two parts are often treated as separate elements. We, we should think about the cloud just as a collection of endpoints we call, and they do something for us. That would be serverless Nirvana, but reality is that there are still some bumps um, towards um, that model. Now, um, like I mentioned, there's this fast dilemma or, or serverless dilemma in, in certain parts of, of the, the industry um, where resource and execution constraints are imposed by many of the classical fast services out there. And they make them <clears throat> almost by nature only suited for lightweight or low, me low to medium um, capacity com components. Mostly, the, this is positioned, like I mentioned, for implementing HTTP endpoints. But um, if customers want to like run heavy duty computational applications or processing workloads, analyzing data, um, 
it's hard for them to to use the, the classical forest services because um, um, they have uh, like a significant premium for the compute cycle um, compared to like other models. And um, when running a larger footprint of workloads, um, the, the, this results in the fast part being being prohibitively expensive. So um, the overall enterprise wide savings potential is limited because like for for the small workloads, there is not much potential, but for the high workloads, it's too expensive. So where where is the speed speed spot from a from a cost savings perspective? Um, what are some of the critical non functions to that we need in order to make serverless the new default? Um, one aspect that I think is really important is fast provision, and not just for small footprint workloads, but for any workload out there. Um, like in the in the Wanderlow part of, of serverless, we've been like super, super focused on code start times and provisioning times and so on, which were all really relevant for serving like HTTP workloads in an instantaneous way for interactive users, keeping the latency low, low <clears throat> making providing a good user experience. But if you think about, on the other hand, like doing some heavy compute heavy stuff on thousands, tens of thousands of cores, um, whether it's 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds doesn't really matter in, in that grand scheme, grand scheme of things anymore. So um, yes, it should be fast. Yes, it should be just a few seconds, but like this super optimization for um, for cold starts versus swarm starts um, is from that workload perspective not that much anymore on the critical path. Um, but, but what is also important is like once we have fast provisioning, it enables what, what I call here poolless architectures for all SaaS. For, for all as a service workloads that are running on top, because like today many as a service offerings, they have like capacity over provisioned in case of load spikes, and so on. If there is a, a re reliable fast provisioning infrastructure service there that they can rely on for um, adding capacity as needed, that significantly significantly helps um, helps their margins, and um, it it just makes their operations much, much leaner. At the same time, there are workloads where like super high execution throughput of, of like hundreds and millions of small units of work um, matters, like for example, in the um, HPC um, um, risk modeling um, space or anything that you would use in order to do simulations of various kinds in various industries that's where this is still still imp very important um also um if we look at it um auto scaling there are two there is like a non serverless way of auto scaling and the serverless way and the non serverless way is always um a bit um lagging behind in the sense of um like there is something that monitors load and if load exceeds a certain threshold over a certain period of time, you might have some low bandwidth fillers in there. The system might decide to add capacity and <clears throat> but it doesn't really know how the, the, the workload is trending or whether it's trending up or down. So it might be adding too much or too little capacity versus in, in the serverless um, world, you you know or you provision capacity exactly based on what you know is is incoming in terms of requests in terms of execution requests and from that you can derive very precisely how much capacity is needed you can see that on the right hand side there with a with a gray line versus the the orange line now an, another important point is like Everything is transient. We think we should think of um, nothing to be static or to be there all the time. If we do it right, basically everything that we provision or that we need in order to run a system 
can be at idle times at zero capacity. And only when the first call comes in and there, there are tricks you can apply there to, um, to make something receive those calls and react to them, even though you are not running something. Um, and then from then on, the system can just autonom autonomically grow and shrink in, in terms of its capacity. And um, if, if load goes down, it reduces it automatically. If load goes up, it does the same way in the other direction. But we, we, we often think of like um, VMs as, as paddle, pets versus cattle. And we should broaden that thinking to like everything. We should treat VPCs like, like um, cattle. We should treat subnets like cattle. We should treat security groups like cattle. Like everything that is out there, we should be able to just provision that for a specific need for a specific customer and have that autonomically vanish once it's not needed anymore. Um, a, a first step into this direction, and by far not finished it, it's really just a baby step, is something that is described by um, by this blog that you can see a link here, um, where we are starting to introduce some of those perspectives, but watch this space, there is more to come. Um, this one is about like giving people the full spectrum of compute up to the largest machines with many terabytes of memory or um, up to also including like <clears throat> mainframe based um, um, runtime environments, giving people access to all of them in, in a serverless fashion. Um, I also indicated before there is this notion of the serverless supercomputer. Um, it, it's really about like thinking everything through in from the perspective of if it was just my laptop, how would I do it? And that helps a lot in terms of both handling interactive workloads where you have a, want to deliver a good user experience and asynchronous workloads where it's just about um, efficient provisioning or processing behind the scenes. So um, just looking at the time here. Um, so I, I talked about most of these things. This is about like making it more general purpose, more, more general architecture friendly um, and, and treating the cloud really like the single computer from all sorts of dimensions. So in summary, um, there is still this very, very large addressable market out there um, this large percentage of workloads that is not running in a serverless fashion. And like I mentioned, the key reasons are um, they are largely focused on, on small to medium um, kind of workloads from a footprint perspective. And we haven't really cr cracked the nut publicly yet about how to um, address a brownfield software with a serverless approach. Um, it is um the, the uniqueness about what, what what I'm trying to highlight here is like it will um, allow us to attract a much, much broader set of workloads than what is there today that will also make it um, even more attractive to run in, in large enterprises um, with more mission critical workloads with, with much higher footprint workloads as well. So um, let me just stop here and see if there are any questions that came up um, that we would like to discuss. Are there any questions for Michael? Okay. Good presentation, Michael. I have one question. Um, you mentioned that there has been not many group, much more improvement in, in virtualization using containers. But there are other ways of virtualization that is more lightweight, like uh, WebAssembly, for instance. Could you, tell, could you say something about these new ways of virtualizing things and could be integrated in the serverless world? Yeah, it was a bit hard to understand. But to paraphrase your question, you're basically saying, um, what is my perspective on WebAssembly? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so WebAssembly, um, totally fits into this architecture because to me, like um, like I said before, at the end of the day, 
we need to think of this as running processes and operating systems if you really dump it down to its most um, bare essence. And that can be like binaries, executables, that can be containers, like container images that you run on this infrastructure, or it can be something that's coming as, as, a, as a web assembly. So um, all of those, those, I would say, packaging formats are, are fair game. Yeah, Michael, thank you. And I also have a question um, uh, about um, the service framework. So um, just as I previously presented, uh, there's a big issue on uh, data intensive workload for service. And uh, the biggest bottleneck is actually IO, but now compute. I know um, the existing service framework is very uh, scalable and resource efficient, but uh, there's some um, effort in the uh, data part, like improving the bandwidth between the, the cloud object storage to serverless framework in this domain. Yeah, that, that is a great point. Um, and I, I, I just spent a little bit of time on that over the last few days. So it's it's good timing you're asking the question. Um, so the the I/O part between like object storage and and um, v, VMs. In the broader sense, I th I think what is critical here is to um, allow flexibility for the users to pick um, merge machine configurations that um, have um, like relatively heavy I/O capabilities and over provision them in terms of CPU because, like you said, in many cases it's the I/O bandwidth that's the bottleneck so if you only provision it based on like the available cpus and don't over provision that part you you won't be able to saturate your network interfaces oh interesting that's a um yeah so yeah basically you are saying we should uh, allow users to not only provision in terms of cpu but also networking and io bandwidth yeah yeah absolutely like um it, i think i've i've seen this as a very common pattern if you want to suck in like large amounts of data from object storage as an example and and you you do not over provision your cpu like you will not be able to to saturate your network io bandwidth thank you thank you very much so um we will then start our uh, talk and demo session. And this is a very compact one hour session. And each speaker only have 10 minutes with eight minute uh, presentation to make it two minutes of Q&A. So um, try to keep on your schedule. So our first speaker is from, um, it's Jagan Choi from Kirkman University. Are you here? Um, would you come and share your, your presentation? And the presentation is about how you can inference service VM model inferences. I can, you need to make him um, co host so he can share his screen. Yes, I'm doing that. Check when you saw
Sorry, we still cannot hear you. Uh, there's something wrong with the. Uh, um... How about now, Alex? I can hear you now, Chen, and I think I can hear speaker. Okay. Uh, okay. Unlike the DNA training process, uh, the image process uh, take your face survey, so you to handle bursty with the rivals and the uh, high scalability double computing can perform well to handle it. But there is still challenges uh, with DNA inference test with server computing. It tests the limitation of the local file storage and unstable performance. And um, sorry, can you share your screen? I think we cannot see your screen yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can see your screen. Thank you. And make sure you are unmuted. Okay. Despite the computing opportunities for the performance of optimization, AWS announced AWS Graviton 2 processor for AWS Lambda based on ARM architecture. Now we could uh, choose the hardware type in server building. Recently, uh, the CPU based on ARM architecture are trending ahead of Intel based CPUs in terms of performance, as you can see the uh, graph. And so, this new hardware for ATEPS Lambda can bring high performance for deep learning inference tests. And nowadays, we can allocate memory to uh, 10 gigabytes for ATEPS Lambda. It is more than three times increase compared to previous limits. And as you can see the picture, uh, higher memory allocation result in higher performance and higher price. So we have um, more memory allocation range to choose from than before. And we need to find the optimal memory allocation with performance and trade uh, and cost trade off. And then we can use uh, DNA model optimizer. The ONIX is the model graph optimizer to improve performance. It provides graph simplifications and node elimination to more com complex node fusions and layout optimizations. Using ONIX, user can optimize deep learning models for inference faster. And there was there is one more thing of the measure, um, Apache TBM. TBM is the compiler that provides opti uh, optimizer level optimization for corresponding backend depending on given, given hardware. User can optim optimize the model for their hardware using TBM. And we will see how well TBM will be optimized for Intel and ARM, ARM architecture in a sub environment. In summary, uh, we can use heterogeneous hardware and optimize compute resource all alloc allocation in sub computing. And we can optimize DNA model using Onyx and TBM. And we can, allow you, we can also use batch processing for DNA inference. Despite these various optimization options, there is no prior work that can help developers to deploy DNA model, DNA model serving workloads using the serverless computing that provides a large configuration space. So we propose all you can inference a publicly available DNA inference environment on a serverless computing environment. All you can inference help the DNA application 
to estimate the performance inference test on various various configurations. So users can build an optimal service model serving environment. All look and inference consists of front end data storage, runtime arbitrator, output, output reporter. A front end takes a DNM model to is queued as an input argument from a user provided in website. Users can specify runtime configuration of the target hardware arm and user can specify the user's usage model optimizations and hardware compilers and user can also specify the batch size for batch processing and the allocated memory size for service environments after the configure front-end request aws api gateway from inference test with user specified fast configuration. Uh, result checker check result archive in data storage that say the result that say the result already been executed each models. And if the model already been executed, the system do not operate any task and respond to previous results in data storage to user. Data storage is consisted of AWS S3, Elastic Cache, and Elastic File System. It stores original models and converted models by optimizers, which is Onyx or TDM, and also store users' execution results. And data storage, data storage consists of AWS ECR, stores runtime container image, as a fast runtime environment. If the model does not execute it, execute it and work, the system operates serverless runtime arbitrator configured uh, by AWS step functions. Use AWS step functions, we can configure sequ sequentially process model convert converter, inference executor, and archiver consisting of AWS Lambda. And metric collector collect execute result and execute lambda metric saved from AWS CloudWatch. After the function work finished, it sends the result to user email with AWS SES. Uh, so. Uh, Okay, let's check the website and visit our website. You can choose the framework um, and model. And uh, compiler and hardware type. You can choose um, both and you can choose the best size and just send it. And then our step function uh, is going to work. And it's if it, the step function finished. Thank you. Uh, you can also yeah. put the link uh, and anybody can watch it in uh, Discord, yeah. right? So step function finish, user can the, yeah, uh, result uh, uh, the lambda metrics and uh, include uh, the latency and throughput and uh, the converting time. If there are any questions, please uh, ask them now, and uh, we need to switch to the next speaker.
We cannot hear you, but we need to move to the next speaker, which is remote. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So it seems like actually screen sharing isn't working for me right now. I'm not getting the option to share my screen. You should be able as a co-host. Could you? Yeah, okay. Ah, maybe. Okay. Now give me one minute. Maybe I will. Maybe it actually works. Right now it's not sharing anything, but it's Trace, could you speak? And Ali, could you hear as well? I can hear you very well, Chen, and I can hear Trules. Yeah, okay. Um, can you see my screen? Not yet. Oh, no, not yet. Okay. Uh... Try to yes. stop sharing and try again. Um... Nothing showing up. No, it's not giving me the. I think it's a. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. I haven't used Zoom in a while, so I'm not sure if. Uh, Maybe we can switch the speakers, Chen, and then uh, come back to you, Trulf. Uh, yeah, like there's no guarantee I'll be able to fix it. There's any chance you can, someone else can show, share yeah, my slides? If, it, if you send us slides, we can show them. No problem. Yeah, the slides are on the website. Um, um, I can share there should my... should be now at least, yeah. Um, I can share my screen and show your slides. No problem. Okay. I like uh, for the for the purpose of the time, probably we can switch to the third talk first and then we switch back. Okay. okay. Sounds very good. Let's okay. do this. Okay. So our next speaker is Joe Hitari. Uh, he will present uh, Sentinel, a bus and memory vision service architecture for lightweight applications. And he's from the University of Tokyo. Excuse me, audio clearing this one.
Okay. Wait, nice now. Share screen. Share screen. You need to do screen sharing. You probably need to do the screen sharing. Alec? Yes, yes, I can I can see now. Screen and everything looks good. Just make sure unmute uh, speaker. I still cannot hear the speaker. Uh, I can see the screen, but I cannot hear anything. How about now? Now is good. Okay. So uh, in service computing, there is an inherent security risk. And uh, from cloud provider's point of view, many applications operate on the same machine. So if there is a single vulnerability in the host kernel, and even one single application could exploit that vulnerability to take the entire control of the host kernel. That malicious application might be able to take uh, over the control of other applications and attack them. So the goals for uh, providers would be to execute those applications securely and also efficiently. To mitigate this security problem, uh, there, there are some existing architectures, and one of them is Gvisor. And Gvisor can be thought of as a container bin architecture and what it does is it traps every system call and emulates it in user space uh, so uh, and the main components of gvisor is sentry and gopher the sentry is the one that traps uh, every system call from the application container and emulates in user space and there's another process separate process called gopher and this is the process to uh, for handling file system accesses and the second existing architecture is Firecracker. Uh, this is a VM based architecture. And what it does is uh, it spawns a VM and executes the application code within that VM. And uh, usually, VM is a pretty much heavy loaded task, but uh, Firecracker uh, strips away most of the functionality to uh, specialize <coughs> its service ex execution. So, when we, when we look at the uh, serverless applications in Wild, we, uh, we can observe some uh, traits, and one of them is this ephemeral execution time. So according to previous work, 50% of the applications run within 670 milliseconds, and 20% of the application can run within uh, 100 milliseconds. And when we think of the uh, cold start latency, which usually falls between 100 to 500 milliseconds, this is, this is too long for most of the applications. This motivated us to propose Sentinel. And uh, looking at those lightweight applications, we observed four characteristics. Uh, first one is its short, short execution time, usually within a second. And second one is its limited uh, change to the underlying file system. The third one is uh, they don't issue complicated system calls, such as mount or BPF. And the fourth one is uh, that most of the those kind of applications are written in a single threaded manner. So Sentinel aims to uh, virtualize these kind of containers as efficiently as possible, and it's built in built as a container-based architecture because containers spin up time tend to be much uh, shorter than VM spin time. And Sentinel aims to uh, quickly emulate those kind of limited system calls, bare minimum system call virtualization with P trace system call with P trace system class. So here are the comparisons. 
on the left is G Bisler, and um, we can see uh, there are two components, and upon each file, every file accesses the two processes uh, communicate with each other over P9 protocol, and this can be very costly. Around right the middle is Firecracker, and even though it's a lightweight VM, it's still a virtual machine, so it consumes a lot of memory by creating and operating VM. And on the right is Sentinel, and um, so it, Sentinel performs read-only mount to the host file system and retains the change in memory. So even if Sentinel is taken over by the malicious application, all they can do is to read the whole host uh, file system. So uh, the damage is minimized. And we also uh, realized the uh, virtualization with a single process per application. We now move on to the evaluation section. Our targets uh, are these four targets. And uh, the first one is run C. This is the uh, Docker's default container runtime. And the second one is run SC, it's JVisor's runtime. Third one is Firecracker. And fourth one is uh, Kata runtime. This is Kata container's runtime. And uh, run SC, Firecracker, and Kata runtime uh, provides uh, virtualization uh, functionality to securely execute the application, but run C does not. So our Sentinel's goal is to uh, perform as close as possible to run C and beat all the three other architectures. First, we measured startup uh, latency, and here's the graph. And counterintuitively, Sentinel even beats Run C. Uh, we attrib attribute this performance benefit to uh, to Rust uh, because Sentinel is implemented in Rust, and Run C is implemented in Go, so it's simply faster. And also, uh, it has lower tail latency, which is which tends to be very critical in crowded environments. And it has up to ten times faster startup latency than uh, existing architectures. Second one is end-to-end -end latencies for some benchmarks uh, applications. And as you can see on the graph, uh, it's a, it's a, a log-scale graph uh, ratio to run C's performance. Um, Sentinel performs uh, as close as, uh, Sentinel speed is the closest to run C's uh, in every benchmark applications. And it performs up to uh, 8.13 times shorter execution time. And last but not least, we measured memory footprint. And this graph is also a log-based graph uh, issue to Sentinel's uh, memory footprint. And we measured two applications, Sleep and GCP Echo Server. And Sentinel's performance is 69.9% uh, better than Run-C, 89% uh, lower than Firecracker, and 98% lower than Kata Runtime. To wrap up, uh, we proposed Sentinel, a serverless architecture for lightweight applications, and it demonstrated uh, uh, some of the performance benefits compared to existing architectures. And this is the public link to the GitHub, so please check if it interests you. And for future work, we uh, would like to support WarmStart, which is critical in serverless uh, architecture, and also uh, supporting uh, full OCI spec compatibility and other uh, env execution environments than x86 Linux. Is, in, is on our list. So that will be it for the presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Joe. And uh, we will take one question while I'm switching the laptop. Please go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, you said that the limit the uh, the binaries that are thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, because uh, existing architectures are made very very much in a complicated way. For example, GFIs is implemented as a user space kernel, but at the same time it's a runtime. So it has to like abstract many um, like provide many like over subtractions. So making it a Single thread manner, it's the, the structure will be like simplified very much. For example, we don't have to implement locks, we don't have to like do other fancy things, and we can tie like we can assume that like there's only one process running in the whole architecture, so that makes the implement implementation cost much lower and much faster. Okay, thank you, thank you, Joe. So next, we will switch back to uh, Truis, and he will present us impact of macro architecture state reuse on serverless functions. And could you take it over? 
choice? Uh, yes, I could. Um, so yeah, could someone share my slides? Because I still, yeah, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so welcome to my presentation of our paper. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So uh, yeah, I'll start by defining what we mean by microarchitectural states. And um, by microarchitectural state, we refer to the state of in-core performance enhancing structures, um, primarily the branch target buffer that stores uh, mappings between branches and their targets and the instruction cache. And these structures are crucial for processor performance, but they need temporal locality in the workloads that are executed in order to work effectively. Next slide, please. Um, so let's look at how this compares to the characteristics of serverless functions. So serverless functions are short running in general, uh, often less than one second, and many are less than 100 milliseconds. And um, they are often invoked infrequently, which means that providers need to interleave the execution of different functions on the same processor core in order to uh, maintain a high utilization of um, data center processors. And these factors contribute to um, reducing the temporal locality of serverless workloads. Next slide. Um, so the problem with this is that interleaved execution of serverless functions crashes the microarchitectural state as observed by prior work. And um, if we, for example, look at a invocation sequence of two functions, um, A and B, um, if we invoke A enough times to warm up the microarchitectural state, uh, we see that the um, next subsequent invocation of A will start from a completely cold state because the invocation of function B will overwrite the microarchitectural state. Uh, next slide. And uh, prior work also observes that uh, this, in at least some cases, adversely affects the performance of uh, serverless functions. Next slide. And uh, But two questions that aren't answered are um, which general properties make serverless functions vulnerable to performance degradation as a result from microarchitectural state trashing, and also, uh, what is the performance opportunity left to uh, processor optimizations that specifically target these kinds of very short running serverless functions? Uh, next slide. Uh, so we use an experimental setup where we uh, consisting of a workload suite of uh, representative and synthetic functions uh, implemented in Node.js and Python, and we execute them in two modes, uh, interleaved and back-to-back. -back. And we simulate the interleaved execution by uh, executing a, a function that is designed to completely thrash the microarchitectural state after each function invocation. And we, we, we pin both of these functions to the same processor core. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the first uh, result I will present from uh, our work is um, an analysis of where processor time is um, spent when executing a serverless workload, because the execution lifecycle of a workload involves a lot more than the uh, core uh, functionality itself. It involves um, a lot of invocation machinery for encoding and decoding requests and results and uh, etc. And this informs us about whether some part of an application, the application lifecycle, is uh, disproportionately affected by um, state thrashing. Um, and we see, and the, the general pattern we see is that runtime appears to be um, very uh, important because if we, for example, compare the autocomplete and dynamic HTML workloads, which are very short running uh, Node.js functions uh, with runtimes less than one, one millisecond to uh, the image resize and um, OCR um, functions that have runtimes of uh, more than 500 milliseconds, uh, we see that the short running functions um, are significantly more affected by state trashing than the longer running functions. Um, however, there are more to it than that, because uh, if we compare the Python, the FibPy 1000 workload that calculates the 
thousand Fibonacci number using Python, we see that it has a similar it has a similar runtime to the dynamic HTML workload, but only the dynamic HTML workload is um, affected by state trashing. Um, so um, we want to dig one step deeper. Um, next slide, please. So to understand more about what's going on, we we uh, use um, what is known as a top-down analysis. That is a uh, microarchitectural bottleneck analysis developed by Intel that classifies uh, processor pipeline stalls based on the component that costs them. So if you have a high degree of front-end boundedness, it means that the processor front-end supplies instructions at a sufficiently, uh, is unable to supply instructions at a sufficiently high rate. And we see once again that um, short running functions in general uh, uh, have a significant lower performance and they are more vulnerable to interleaved execution. Um, longer running functions, on the other hand, have better overall performance and no vulnerability to interleaving. Uh, but in particular, it appears that uh, the short running Node.js functions are both particularly vulnerable to state crashing, but are also uh, heavily front-end bound. Um, next slide, please. So at this point, we can um, derive a hypothesis that the sensitivity to state trashing depends on uh, the function execution time and the function implementation language. Um, the question then is um, which particular aspect of um, implementation language um, determines the a function's vulnerability to state trashing. And remember that particularly Node.js uh, workloads were front-end bound and prior work suggests that this indicates uh, workloads with a large code um, footprint, um, meaning that they put a lot of pressure on the instruction cache of the processor and also the, the BTB. Um, next slide, please. So to confirm this hypothesis, we uh, estimate the code footprints of, a, uh, of our workloads and we do this using a method that um, simulates how much cache, the size of the instruction cache that is needed to fit the entire instruction working set of a, a function. And we find that indeed our Node.js workloads have a bigger code footprint than our Python workloads, which confirms our hypothesis about the impact of code footprints. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, from this, from these results, we conclude that uh, microarchitectural structures warm up quickly, and this is not new information. This is generally widely known, but um, indeed, for most, and we also see that most serve. We see that um, only a very limited set of serverless functions actually benefit from being executed from a warm microarchitectural states. And these are functions with very short runtimes of less than one millisecond and functions with large code footprints. Uh, for all other functions, um, the current in-core processor optimizations generally function as expected. And the, function, the functions that actually suffer from this issue are quite rare in real world um, deployments. So uh, next slide. Okay, thank you, Trace. Um, hey dear, we can take one question for Trace, hey dear. Any? Okay, Alec, hey dear, any questions online? Okay, Alec, we cannot I, hear. I, I was just speaking on mute. I realized I I did not see any questions online, but uh, you can ask them on Discord. I'm also putting the invite to Discord. So if you join Zoom, you will find the invite to Discord and Zoom chat. Okay, then we will switch to the first talk then. Uh, our next presenter is Mohak from uh, Technical University, the MUNAC, and he will present us migrating from microservices to serverless an IoT platform case study. Please take it over. We can see your screen. It all looks good. Yeah, but we, I cannot hear you. Can you make sure you are unmuted? Uh, 
Okay, good now. Try now again. All right. I can hear you, but you are not sharing screen right now. Oh, you are sharing screen, but we are not seeing your presentation. I see screen number one and lot of things on your desktop. <laughs> Can you see it now? No, not? still your desktop. Sorry. Okay. Now looks good. I can see your uh, presentation. All right, so now it's perfect, right? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Mok Chada. I'm a third year PhD student at uh, JRO Computer Architecture and Power Systems at the Technical University of Munich. And this is my WSC 2022 presentation. So uh, the presentation is structured as follows. Uh, first, I will talk about the motivation behind the work, uh, goals of the work, then some background information, followed by a migration methodology, experimental setup results, and finally conclusion in future work. Uh, so uh, most cloud native applications today are based on uh, the microservices architecture. So the main idea behind this is that uh, it enables the development of an application as a sort of small independent services uh, which communicate with each other. So uh, it has several advantages. Uh, first, the application is decomposed uh, into a set of manageable services which are faster to develop and easier to understand. And each service can be developed independently by a team that is focused particularly on that service. Uh, moreover, the, a particular service is not really bounded uh, to a set of technologies and each service can be independently deployed and scaled. But there are also several disadvantages. So testing a microservices based architecture based application is uh, more difficult and the developer uh, needs to think about the configuration, deployment, resource provisioning, and uh, scaling of these services. Uh, so uh, another competing paradigms, which is serverless computing. So not too much detail about this, uh, but it kind of works like a back box from the user's perspective, right? So uh, the developer essentially uh, writes code and deploys it on a fast platform and obtains an API endpoint through which the function can be ignored. And uh, fast functions are traditionally more fine-grained than microservices. Uh, of, they use a finer grain uh, billing policy, and most of the times you can uh, have better use resource utilization. Uh, it is uh, stateless, right? Uh, and also there are a lot of performance variations due to uh, cold start latencies. So uh, both microservices and serverless architecture have the advantages, disadvantages, and the decision to adopt uh, one over the other depends on several factors. So uh, to try and answer that question in this work, we uh, migrate a microservices-based uh, IoT platform application onto Apache OpenWhisk and Google Cloud Run. Uh, we evaluate uh, the different deployment strategies uh, with respect to different performance metrics. And uh, finally, uh, highlight some lessons learned uh, from this work. All right, so uh, the IoT platform uh, application was uh, designed actually at our chair uh, to enable numerous uh, IoT ap applications uh, such as uh, room monitoring. So it consists of several uh, independent microservices uh, that can interact with each other to provide different functionality. So, so the main uh, component is uh, the IoT core, back, IoT core uh, which uh, allows users to manage uh, devices, uh, sensors, uh, authentication, authorization tokens uh, for secure communication uh, with the end devices. And uh, all uh, data uh, related to the users, uh, devices, sensors, consumers uh, is stored in MariaDB. Uh, so the devices uh, can send uh, their data through uh, three different gateways. And then uh, the data is uh, forwarded to Kafka, uh, which is then stored, finally stored as an index, index in Elasticsearch uh, using uh, Kafka Connect. So the data also can be visualized uh, using Kibana. 
So for interacting uh, with the IoT platform, uh, there are uh, several API endpoints which the users and consumers can use and uh, essentially perform CRUD operations. And uh, but in this work, we mostly uh, just focus on uh, six different API endpoints. So for migrating uh, this Microsoft Service application uh, to uh, a fast-paced uh, application, we essentially uh, tried to minimize code changes. Uh, so for that, we did not really uh, focus on changing any of the off-the-shelf software components, right? For example, like Elasticsearch or MariaDB. Uh, we only focused on uh, the backend uh, and um, migrated that onto OpenBISC and GCR. And also we uh, migrated the HTTP gateway to a complete fast-paced implementation. All right. And uh, so the basic uh, methodology behind the migration that uh, we decompose the application logic uh, for each specific API endpoint uh, into a separate function. So for example, if you look at the device controller, right? So it has different functionalities like get, add, update, and delete. So the idea is that you flatten everything and uh, make it uh, independent uh, functions. And uh, so we also uh, made use of action sequencing uh, in OpenWIS uh, to chain the authentication function uh, with the different API endpoints. So the authentication is required for almost every API call. So uh, OpenWIS provides a sequencing functionality, which was easily utilized. And for GCR, uh, we actually merge the authentication function within one function. So to generalize this process a bit, uh, so uh, essentially all state which is stored within a service uh, has to be migrated to remote storage and fast. And we need to make changes to the communication protocols to work with a particular fast platform. For example, if you're using a Thrift RPC, you have to use a gRPC for GCR. And uh, finally, uh, implementation of an abstract interface that uh, intercepts an incoming request uh, to an API endpoint and forwards it to the appropriate uh, OpenBISC or GCR function. All right. So, uh, so for fairness, we deployed all the off-the-shelf uh, services which are common across all deployments on a separate GKE cluster. And we considered four different deployment strategies. So uh, GKE and uh, two configurations of the HPA for that. Uh, so 50% CPU utilization, 80% CPU utilization. And we deployed a self-hosted open WISC uh, on top of a uh, GKE cluster. And then finally, this, uh, manage uh, Google Cloud Run. So for exact configurations, uh, please refer to the paper. Uh, experiment procedure. So we uh, used the regression testing tool K6 uh, from Grafana Lab for our experiments. And K6 essentially utilizes uh, virtual users, which are kind of entities that make HTTP requests and uh, try to perform a given test as many of number of times as possible. And we used our VM, uh, which was hosted on our compute cloud. And we considered uh, different load patterns. Uh, so in total, around 72 experiments of 30 minutes each. And uh, total number of requests were in eight figures. Right, so uh, some brief results. So, uh, so the top figure basically shows the uh, number of requests for one uh, load pattern, uh, while the bottom one shows uh, the P95 response times for the different deployment strategies. So uh, for most API endpoints, what we observed was that GKE standard uh, actually performed best, uh, followed by GCR and then uh, OpenWISC. So we had a significant uh, increase in the P95 response time for OpenWISC uh, for greater than uh, 2,000 requests per second, uh, per 10 seconds. And uh, yeah, so we thought this was mostly because of uh, sequencing actions in OpenWISC, and uh, which is actually true. And then, uh, the initial response times, of course, in GCR is really high, right? Because of cold starts. And uh, in contrast to the previous endpoint, which was sensor get, this is the HTTP gateway. Uh, in this case, we actually observed uh, significantly better performance with open WISC. So actually in gateway, you don't really need authentication. So it was an independent function, uh, right? And also if you look at uh, open WISC, right? Uh, so in GCR, for example, the number of CPU resources allocated are limited uh, to a function, but with OpenWISC, uh, 
you don't really do that. Only the memory you can control and the CPU is unlimited. So it ultimately leads to better performance. But uh, so the main takeaways, right? So uh, generally uh, GKE uh, sessions perform best uh, with the highest performance followed by OpenWhisk and then GCR. Uh, across the different uh, load patterns, we did not really absorb much differences and uh, OpenWhisk that traditionally had uh, significantly higher response times with uh, large number of requests. Uh, so GK50 uh, performs slightly better uh, than GK80, which is also uh, based on intuition, right? Because the bots will scale earlier. And uh, GCR overall uh, was uh, more robust uh, than OpenVis. Uh, essentially, anyways, it's like it's a managed service. Uh, so, so some brief cost results, right? For two endpoints in up in the presentation. So, in most cases, they definitely found that per thousand requests, uh, GCR was uh, cheaper, always cheaper, uh, as compared to any of the other deployment strategies. So, uh, to summarize, uh, but uh, so migration. Uh, migrating a really big microservice application is essentially ad hoc and uh, time consuming. So it really depends on what the application is, what the dependencies are. And so uh, before starting a migration, uh, the developer should definitely think about the amount of code of that can be re reused and the effort to rewrite new code if necessary. And on traffic bus, uh, response times in GCR can be really high. And uh, GK standard has uh, best performance in terms of best performance. And uh, really also important to understand is like how much should you actually decompose the service, right? So from our experiments, what we observed that that if you have a, if you are migrating a deeply nested microservice, then uh, any decompose it uh, into individual fast functions, then that can lead to worse performance and more cost. So uh, it's actually a trade-off. So how much you can you should decompose. And in the future, we uh, plan to uh, work with uh, GKE Autopilot, uh, which is uh, a new thing, and uh, also different configurations of FAST. For example, uh, increasing concurrency per function instance, and uh, also provisioning minimum number of instances, for example, in GCR. And then also we are looking at a, a bigger microservice application, how to come up do this migration process in a more principled way and uh, try to automate it, right? So yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. So if you have any questions, please. Um, thank you very much, Mohan, because we are already 10 minutes behind. So let's um, right, go to the last presentation, which is, uh, which is brought by Costas, transferring transactional business process to FAST. You need to make Costas a uh, co-host. Yes, I'm doing that. Okay. Okay. Costa, can you try to share your screen? Yes, I'm doing it right now. Is everything okay? Everything looks great. Just remember, we are really behind the time. So if you can keep the presentation short, that would be really great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Costas. We will talk about transferring transactional business processes to FAS. Before diving into paper's content, I want to tell you a few things about designing business processes with BPMN. BPMN is a language that has already a community that does some interesting things there. It is used by managers, business analysts, and even technical debate developers who can build their whole applications uh, there. Its main fields are management to organize works, online payments, purchases, and many more. But what exactly is BPMN2? It's nothing than a workflow method. Visual shapes with semantic meanings uh, can make workflows. See this small workflow, for example. At first step, we want to book a ticket. Then there is a symbol that, uh, that represents an exclusive uh, gateway con and checks if the ticket is available. And if it is, we'll proceed to the right branch. The thing is that this visual language is defined in an XML standard. Using BPMN engines, this workflow can be executed, validated, and tested. 
combining tasks with, co with code, whole applications can be built based on these workflows. And we know that FAST is a trend now because it offers a variety of benefits that I assume you already know. So we usually want to transfer our application in a cloud serverless environment with a bunch of functions that are offered as a service. And these functions can be connected using orchestrator definitions, another workflow language that uh, describes the relationships. So having uh, one set of visual BPM and shapes and another one of fast workflow definitions, we will try to match these two sets in order to be able to, to take any BPMN application to FAST platform. And we will name this process mapping BPMN to FAST. To implement this mapping, some things are simple. Some BPMN concepts map one-to-one -to, -one to FAST concepts. For example, the BPMN concept of a task naturally maps to FAST concept of a function. In this work, I use OpenWhisk as a reference platform. OpenWhisk Composer also supports sequences, exclusive and parallel branchings, and so on. Others have proposed this one, one mapping in the past, but this is not the whole story. There are challenges that we focus on. As a, cha a challenge occurs due to BPMN's blocking nature. For example, at this business process, we send a message to someone, then the process stops and waits to receive a message, and we have a waiting state that blocks our process. And only when the message is received, the process continues. However, in FAST, blocking is not an option. What we do instead is transforming the message into a trigger for next function. The state can pass as information inside our message. And another possibility is to store and fetch the process state using a remote DB. Expanding this logic, we can replace functions with call compositions. And what I described in previous slide holds for compositions as well. At this example, we have one waiting state, so the process can mentally divi be divided to one composition before and one after the waiting state. Our second challenge is to describe the delay BPMN elements. Delays are timers that will pause the process for some time. Previous work suggests the spin weight dummy loop inside the function that will break only when the time has passed. However, this is not a good practice because it has an upper bound limit of uh, six minutes and uh, because functions cannot run forever, you know, and it will burn our CPU with relevant cost billings. Again, we solve this in an event-driven way using an external service. We think that hybrid fast workflows consisting by orchestration definitions, triggers, and services uh, can solve uh, any challenge. Open with platform comes with uh, the alarm packet service, which executes the cron job tasks. So what we do is calling the service. The service counts one minute for us and then fire the triggers that will invoke our function. And uh, that means that we found a way to emulate delays. As challenge number three, we have more complex BPMN representations, the boundary events. So let's see this example where we have one boundary non-interrupting timer. This timer will be triggered as soon as the task initiates and we will get the end state B only if the task has exceeded the expected processing time. We do not know how to implement boundary timers yet, so how we work? And the answer is uh, think algorithmically. We will simplify our problem uh, to known problems that we know how to solve. The model on the right is an equivalent BPMN model, but the difference is that we know how to map its BPMN elements. A delay is triggered at the same time with the task on the upper branch. And after the delay ends, there's a gateway that checks if the task is actually completed. And this is still valid BPMN. Now using this intermediate model, we can implement our transformation as we know. Looking again, we took uh, the left BPMN representation and ended it up to the right fast model. And here comes our observation. We introduced a little complexity ourselves to our structure. The model on the right is a bit more complex than on the left. And imagine having uh, four or five of those models in your workflow. The fast expression uh, has a bit more complexity in its structure. Looking again at our models, we can focus on the check we introduce and simply omit this check or integrate it to one function. And this can be done easily, I think. The good thing is that working with BPMN, uh, working at BPMN level, you deal with something that is simpler in structure. BPMN programmers will enjoy the simplicity. Well, how about the transactions, you may ask? The point here is that BPMN has high expressive power and its semantic representations traditionally describe transaction applications. The SACA button uh, dominates the majority of them, 
And we can always think sagas as uh, smaller independent transactions that can be compensated if something goes wrong. Since BPMN supports sagas, let's see together an, an, an airline example. In this use case scenario, imagine you want to travel from Athens to Quebec for some conference, but there is not a direct flight for this route. We will have to take a GN Airlines to Berlin and from there Transavia to Quebec. As clients, we are not satisfied with a partial flight. We want a travel agency to guarantee this atomic transaction that both tickets will be booked or none of them will be booked. So a possible implementation could be an application that forwards clients request to event bus. Their lines, the other participants will fetch the request and reserve the tickets. They publish the messages to the bus and the payment service will fetch this message at some time. And if our budget is sufficient for both tickets, we'll publish a successful Saga event to the bus. Otherwise a compensation event because Sagas are things that are things that are done and can be undone. And here we have the BPMN implementation uh, of this work. Apache Kafka acts as a message broker and the flow goes uh, like we described before. The, the participants exchange the messages in the, with the event bus and uh, they trigger their processes. And the saga, uh, the saga will end at the, the, the last participant. So notice that uh, we have BPMN elements that we know how to map them to fast representation. So using the guidelines we described before, we take the following fast model. The processes have been converted to many compositions. Delay and boundary timers are, are described with alarm triggers and Kafka triggers connect the functions to Kafka. Look the two models side by side. I think that uh, fast is typically more complex, especially for BPMN programmers. So to sum up, we addressed some challenges in mapping BPMN to, to OpenWISP. Saga transactions expressed in BPMN straightforwardly can be carried over to OpenWISP. So we can design and exploit the, far, the powerful semantics of BPMN. Some applications will be expressed easier there and then transfer them to FAS. And BPMN is not a new language. It has already a community. This enables business analysts uh, to express processes in a simpler BPMN format than the compared uh, complex uh, workflows of OpenWhisk. And this mapping aims to bridge the simplicity of BPMN uh, to ubiquity and power of fast platform. I did it a bit uh, fast because you asked so. So thank you for your attention. This concludes my talk. I will be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Uh, if there are any questions, please uh, ask, uh, especially in Zoom. And Lucas, can you, Costas, uh, uh, can you stop sharing? And Lucas, can you prepare for your demo? Any questions? Okay, you can always ask the questions in Discord. The, in Zoom, uh, there is a. There are all details how to join Discord channel, and. Uh, Let's go with the demos, which I think will, should be very interesting end of our workshop. And uh, yeah, if you can make it short, that, that's great. And uh, I think you may have the extended version of your demo already linked from the website, right? For anybody who is interested. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, shall I start right away? Go ahead, Lucas. Yeah, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Lucas, I'm a bachelor student at ETH Zurich, and today, I will present to you CPPLOS, a part of my bachelor thesis. Traditionally, utilizing serverless environments for offloading Hello, and compiled. I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, you are not sharing your screen. Yeah, yeah you're not, not sharing your screen. Go, go. Oh, I'm sorry. Try again. I, I'll try. I'll try my best now. Now, now that should work, right? You can see my bottom screen. Now, now I see client code lambda code. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, then let's try again. Traditionally, utilizing serverless environments for offloading in compiled languages is cumbersome. It requires developers to write separate programs, the serverless function itself, and a client which creates invocations. You're also logged into a single serverless environment very easily. Thus, this approach is not modular, not generic, not scalable, and requires a lot of handwritten blue code for serialization and deserialization. Our solution to this problem is CPPLOS, a single source programming model integrating into the compilation work flow uh, through Clang modifications. 
On the left-hand side, we have a simple C++ program, which makes use of CPP list. Here we want to offload calls to Pi estimate. First, we initialize our platform abstraction for AWS. Uh, we can simply define a serverless function from a Lambda in that case. Uh, this Lambda can then be used to dispatch task invocations to AWS Lambda. Once the task invocations are dispatched, we wait for all of the tasks to complete and can merge the results. This example demonstrates the basic concept. The serverless function and the code which interacts with that function are defined in the same code base, making offloading transparent and natural. The glue code that would normally be necessary is all replaced by the framework and managed internally. We evaluated the performance of the benchmarks uh, of the framework using six different benchmarks and two micro benchmarks, and we'll go over some results really quickly. In the high estimation benchmark that we have seen a couple of seconds ago, we achieve near perfect scaling due to uniform task length and an embarrassingly parallel implementation. Other benchmarks so, such as Knapsack don't scale quite as well. Here we only achieve a rather mediocre speed up, even with a lot of parallelism. Simulations, however, confirmed that the branch and bound implementation that we use for parallelization scales badly as a result of the limitations of the request response model that we currently have with CPP list. Although speed up might be suboptimal, the overhead added at the cloud provider is statistically insignificant, as we have found out, and the overhead is dominated by algorithmic restrictions in the case of our benchmarks, not by CPP list itself. Uh, to conclude, the CPP list compilation architecture with its language extensions allows for elegant compile time definitions of serverless functions. And the overhead is pure, uh, that is incurred by the framework is only significant if many small tasks or very the large amounts of data have to be transmitted. And for a small trivial task, the overhead is around one millisecond and increases when more data needs to be serialized. Uh, that was it already from my small demo today. Uh, the full version with a lot more explanation can be found uh, on YouTube. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Lucas, and I encourage everybody to check the longer version. It's uh, on YouTube and you can easily fast forward and also look and then ask questions in Discord. Let's go to the next demo. Malte, can you share your screen? I can see your screen. It looks, looks very good. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Also, perfect. You uh, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Malta, I'm also a um, bachelor student at ETH Zurich, and I will talk about Fast Profiler. Um, so, Fast Profiler is a tool uh, to, with the goal to capture any metric of a serverless function execution in an end to end way. So for this purpose, we build a model of framework. Uh, you can easily extend it with user-defined routines uh, to collect metrics of any kind during your execution of a function. We developed also a distributed tracer that links different function invocations in a trace so that the measurements can also be conducted in a serverless uh, application that may involve multiple functions. And the tool and the profiling format is general enough to be independent of the fast platform. So it enables to be the results comparable between different, different providers. Uh, here you see the general structure of the tool. So give me a function code for whose execution you want to collect data. You need to define a measurement plan that defines which measurement you want to perform. Uh, here you have also the possibility to include um, user-defined routines. And then fast profile is executed in the serverless execution environment. And the serverless function is executed under active instrumentation and all your measurement routines are collecting the data during your run. And at the end, it all gets exported to your destination of choice uh, such that you can analyze and visualize it offline in your local machine. Um, so we provide a Python implementation of fast profiler. All you need to do is to import the package and to uh, instrument your entry point of the function by adding a single um, decorator. Um, here you see an example of a reconstructed service graph. So the cycle symbolizes an execution of one serverless function, while the square symbolizes a service that led to the execution of one function. And all the, the size of the bubbles and the squares um, are relative to to the latency and the execution time. Uh, we have published a tool on GitHub 
and currently supporting AWS and Google Cloud. And yeah, that's all from my side. And you can find also more information in the section. Thank you. And that was very good. And again, uh, if there are any questions, please ask them in uh, Discord uh, channel. And uh, we can continue con conversation. And now, finally, the final uh, two demos, Marcin. I can see, I think I can see your screen. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, everything sounds okay. good. Okay, great. Thanks. So I will conclude the demo session with two presentations of other software that we are currently developing in our lab. And I think, I hope that you will find it quite interesting. So for the first demo, I want to present our benchmark suite uh, SEPs. Uh, we originally introduced the benchmark suite uh, last year at the Middleware Conference. Uh, and we're happy to share that many research uh, labs have found it quite useful. And we are very happy that it can has been used to evaluate several systems. We originally focused on a building, automatic building of Python Node.js functions that we later deployed to the main commercial platforms of AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. And we provided a set of automatic experiments that you can deploy and run to get the data and information about performance overheads of the selected platform. Since that time, we had other supports for C++ function to focus more a little, a little bit on more on application that we want to port to serverless that require higher performance. We had a support uh, for benchmarking of uh, OpenWhisk platform, and we we're also working on the support for other platforms such as Fusion and Knative. And we added a couple of new features. Uh, we have an uh, ongoing uh, pull request that will be merged soon that uh, comes with a set of automatic benchmark for measuring the cost and performance of different ways of communicating on serverless platforms. Uh, we are bringing support um, the benchmarking of functions and applications that require high performance. But the most interesting change that I want to mention a little bit is uh, the support for serverless workflows that have been uh, added and contributed by Lauren Brunner, who developed this as part of his master thesis. Uh, in his work, uh, Lorin developed a uh, platform, platform agnostic model for workflow that allows you to specify a big workflow consisting of many functions and data nodes. And later, uh, our system can translate it into a definition to all, again, three major cloud providers. And using that, we can measure the performance overhead and also analyze the scalability of workflows. Uh, the, the project is an ongoing on GitHub. We have many ongoing pull requests. We are happy to, for, uh, to hear more about the feedback and the feature requests. And if you want to know more about the project, uh, you can check out the middleware talk and the paper. And also, if you want to know more about benchmarking workflows, there's already available at the technical report by Lauren on that topic. And now I will switch to the second demo. Uh, for the second part that I wanted to mention to, uh, today is ARFAS. It's our solution to the problem of uh, slow invocations and low performance of serverless. The main motivation of our work came from working with high performance systems, which are uh, usually quite static in the resource allocation, but they benefit quite heavily from the availability of high speed networks, in particular RDMA, where we can operate directly on the memory of remote servers. On the contrary, FAST, as we know, is much more flexible, but it comes with a lot of uh, ad ad added overhead, particularly because of the multi-step invocation pipeline. In RFAS, we try to take the best of both worlds. We want to make sure that uh, we can use the high-speed networks, but also we want to uh, work on uh, dynamically allocated and ephemeral resources. Uh, on a very high level, we can summarize our work with this very simple C++ code sample that is offloading work, um, computational work uh, to, uh, to, to a serverless function. First, we introduce the concept of a server li serverless leases, which slightly expands on the definition of a serverless function, still working with ephemeral resources, but providing a little bit more information for us to integrate RDMA connections. Uh, we provide a, a set of RDMA abstractions to make writing functions easier and do not get entangled into the low level of network programming. And finally, we provide standard uh, synchronous and asynchronous ways of invoking functions. As a teaser of the results that we achieved, we show an example of Monte Carlo simulations from the passive benchmark suite. 
And there we took the OpenMP implementation and compared it in two modes where we offload all of the work in parallel to many RFAS functions. And the second mode where we combine both workloads. So, so this is really the use case that we want to uh, promote, that we can run par uh, parallel uh, and high scaling workloads, and then additionally allocate the dynamic resources in the cloud or in the data center. And here we can show that uh, our work scales uh, quite well in comparison to OpenMP until we saturate the network bandwidth. And also by allocating more resources, we can significantly speed up the application. Again, in this, uh, uh, in this example, we scale quite well until we just a situation where the function is running for 10 to 15 milliseconds and is simply too fast for the amount of data that we need to move. Uh, the project is available on open source license on GitHub. Uh, we are very happy uh, to receive feedback and uh, feature requests. Thank you. Thank you. That was very good and very fast. Uh, again, uh, all the presentations and uh, links to extended version and so on are on YouTube. Please, uh, if you are not subscribers, subscribe to our mailing list and use it to share. Uh, announcements or anything you want. And then finally, we hope to see you again in future. Um, we will be organizing either online only or hybrid workshop. So a um, lot of things should be happening with serverless. I think that's all. Thank you. Chen, anything else or Ali you want to add at the end of the workshop? Yeah, thank you all for in-person attendance. And let's keep in touch in the Discord channel, right? Um, if like the Alec already showed the link. Please make sure you join the uh, Discord channel and we will keep in touch. That's it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everybody for making to the end. <laughs>